These highlights in the news at this hour. Apollo 17 moon mission launch halted just 30 seconds before liftoff because of problems with the automatic sequencer. Mission Control is now recycling for a possible relaunch. Of the WR New York, your station for news as it happens. Just to remind you again that Jack Allen at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida will be on hand to keep us posted on what is going on in the recycling because of the delay of the Apollo 17 launching. And he will, of course, be broadcasting liftoff if and when it comes tonight. And now, Gene Shepard. short show tonight because of this uh, thing that's going down at uh, Camp Kennedy. Hey, I have a lot of friends down there who are waiting to watch that blast off. You know, have you ever been in Florida at the time they shot a rocket off? It's a, it's a, it's a, it can be seen in almost every part of the state. Uh, in fact, down in Miami, uh, on a good night when they blast, even in the daytime, uh, they can see that long, fantastic streak in the sky. And uh, it's it's a really spectacular. You know, uh, for those of you who have just tuned in, wonder what's going on. Uh, it's hard to uh, conceive of anybody not knowing. But 30 seconds before these guys were to take off for the moon, at uh, what was it, 10:53, uh, something like that, almost exactly 10:53, I believe, 9:53. I'm sorry, at 9:53, uh, the the countdown was in its uh, it's in its last minute. And it was going down, you know, 49, 48, and so on down. And all of a sudden, it stopped at 30. And 30 seconds before they were to take off, uh, one of the uh, circuits, there was some problem in the circuit, uh, uh, which uh, they undoubtedly they will explain later on when they come back on. But it was all done automatically. Of course, there was no, not one guy uh, pressed the button and says, hold, you know, stop the presses, stop. Uh, the middle astronauts worried they uh, hold it. Uh, nobody <laughs> didn't work like that. This is. Can you imagine the fantastic uh, electronic systems that uh, go into this rocket, into the entire uh, space project? Now, somebody brought up in the in the control room just a couple of minutes ago before uh, we came on the air that there there would be no way for them to send a uh, a missile, a rocket especially a manned rocket, to the moon if the transistor had not been invented. you agree with that, Herb? Uh, if there, all this had to be done with radio tubes, it would have been totally impossible. Uh, I'd like to just know the numerical count, the actual count of the number of uh, transistors and, <laughs> and associated electrical circuits that are involved in this entire project. Now, that includes even the telemetric systems. Uh, the uh, the uh, communication systems, the guidance systems, all the rest of it, just just staggering. 
Uh, it's a fantastic thing, and and I just hope you know it's it is true, and I, and I don't worry about those people. There's always a certain number of people who are invariably bored by anything uh, that doesn't affect their lives directly. This this is a, a fact of life. In fact, you know, it's curious. A couple of weeks ago, I did a show about physics. You remember that night? And it was interesting to see that the mail was divided completely, one down, right down the middle. One group has said, you know, people said it was a fantastic, interesting show. They loved it. And the other group said, I'm bored. I'm totally bored. Why don't you talk about when you were a kid? And uh, so they, those people, you just can't, uh, you just can't uh, constantly cater to them. But they're always out there. Uh, curiously enough, um, uh, it might interest you to know that uh, that since we were carrying this rocket shoot, uh, we were picking it up. Uh, Jack Allen is now one of WOR's newsmen is now down on the Cape waiting. Uh, in about uh, oh, 45 minutes or so, they'll probably be going back to him. I think they put it off for an hour. Uh, when uh, we were carrying this uh, shoot, uh, of course, naturally the news came on uh, later on. We already got calls here at the station for people complaining. Uh, <laughs> well, what are you carrying that for? Why don't you carry on? We want to hear. Uh, we want to hear what happened to Roosevelt Raceway tonight. Are we going to hear what happened at the raceway? And uh, they were all calling up, which means that really, in a, in a way, that most people are not only unaware of most of the vast, uh, I suppose you can call them historical things during their time, but they're positively irritated by them. Uh, I. <laughs> I, I've seen this so many times that it's so. So I suppose that that what it boils down to is that many people basically are totally self-involved. That uh, what affects them is important. What isn't is irrelevant, ridiculous, and uh, should not be even uh, allowed to happen. Now uh, you know it, uh, the thing that hit me immediately is uh, is the is uh, the the just the emotional human thing that you had three men uh, who have been training now for how many years, all three of them, uh, have been training with one goal, one object in mind. And they've been directing their entire uh, waking hours uh, all day long, probably half the night in many cases, to this one instant in time. Uh, there are very few of us who have uh, any kind of professions that are directed in that direction. And incidentally, it's like one instant that there is their entire career after that even then it's it's all downhill uh that one instant uh, that that uh, <laughs> that everything hangs in the balance and here they are they're lying in their their cubicle there that uh, tiny space capsule they're all strapped in all their equipment is ready they've got all their their uh their space gear is all under control and all the lights this fantastic uh, control board that they've got in front of them which uh, staggers the imagination of any pilot. Do you agree, Herb? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, it, fellas, I want to tell you this. This flight is totally IFR all the way, uh, and uh, it's pure instruments, and such instruments as you couldn't comprehend, uh, any of you who are pilots. But uh, here they are, all three of them, strapped into this thing. And, uh, and of course, they have all kinds of, of digital Nixie counters, you know what these Nixie tubes are. Nixie, for those of you who don't know what a Nixie tube is, a Nixie is a little electronic uh, uh, glow-type tube that glows numerals or symbols, depending on the type of excitation that's given. It. It's these little yellow, uh, sometimes red letters, numbers that flick off and on. With uh, Those are called Nixies. And so uh, here they are. They're lying flat on their back waiting and it's a very emotional moment because nobody really ultimately knows what's going to happen at the time of blast off because when you deal with such cataclysmic forces and i mean stupendous forces 54 freight cars of liquid oxygen 54 freight cars of liquid oxygen and and there are very few more volatile substances around than liquid oxygen <laughs> Uh, that's what it took to load this baby up for just the blast off. That's fuel. Well, here they are. They're 40 stories high. You know, that rocket is 40 stories high, 4-0, which is roughly, uh, well, it's uh, almost double the height of this building here. This is no small building. So 40 stories up. There they are in this tiny capsule lying flat in these, uh, these space, uh, beautifully uh, molded uh, space 
uh, seats that they're in. Have you ever seen the seats they're in? Well, if you, in case you're, you're, you're not familiar with those seats, these seats, each one, uh, costs a fabulous amount. Each one of those seats costs probably as much as the house you're living in. <laughs> uh, each seat is, uh, is a complete electrical circuit in itself, in case you're curious. But the seat is all got all kinds of uh, telemetric electrodes and so on built into it. And so when the, so when the, uh, the, the spaceman uh, is strapped into the seat, these various electrodes, of course, all are automatically attached to his his uh, his suit and to his body, so that outside, uh, thousands of miles away, they can read what his pulse is, they can read what his respiration rate is, and his temperature, and everything else that's going on all the while. Well, now that that seat, of course, is a transmitter of all this. The seat is is like a is like a plug into which he's plugged, and all this stuff goes directed down into the trunk of the the telemetric system in the uh, capsule and then out into the transmitters and finally ultimately to the external antennas and is transmitted back to the earth but the seat itself is a fabulous piece of business and each one of those seats by the way is molded and shaped to the specific astronaut who uses it which means that uh, every time of course uh, they, they go up the three seats are are unique they, they, they're not just run off on a production line and it's like a tailor-made suit. And so, as the guy lowers himself into his particular seat that's all strapped in and buttoned down, and, and here he's lying here, and the Nixies are popping off, and it says uh, 20, it says, you know, it says 31, it says 29, you know, and the numbers are all going off, and everything is cool. All the lights are green. Everything looks great. And uh, the ultimate Nixie, which tells them how much time they've got, the ultimate computer, which tells them how much they can, time for blast off is right in front of them and up above them. And so it says 45, 44, 43, these little red numbers going off, 42, 41, and there's that lower and lower. Now, 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 these are men, you know. Remember, these are not machines. These are men. No matter how well trained you are, uh, there is this, this, this great feeling of emotion. It's, it's a whole life is directed at this moment, and nobody knows really what's going to happen. And uh, here they are. They're they're 41 seconds away from this moment, this fantastic moment when that 54 freight cars of liquid oxygen is set off. <laughs> well, whoo! And and uh, uh, if you've ever been near a rocket, a major NASA rocket, when it goes off, of course the nearness is a matter of uh, of argument. Uh, being near to one of these babies is like being a mile and a half away, but. Uh, if you've ever been around a rocket, I happened to be on a missile cruiser one day when they, when they, uh, when they shot off or ignited or directed two major rockets, and it was a fantastic experience. It's a cruiser, giant ship, and uh, it had a crew of about a thousand, close to a thousand. And when the rocket was ignited, just went, boom, the whole ship just sank down in the water. You could just feel the whole ship just the the, the reaction was so great that the ship just just uh, sort of jarred and, and just settled down in the water. It's a tremendous Navy ship. And the blast shock wave uh, knocked me back flat. I was, I was way up uh, on the bridge someplace, and I was just knocked flat up against the wall, uh, the bulkhead, excuse me. And uh, that was not anywhere near this kind of rocket. It was just a tiny rocket compared to anything like this. But uh, here these guys are laying up there, uh, waiting in, and uh, it's it's now down to 39, 37. You know they're, they're silent. I can't imagine they were saying much at that moment. And uh, they're looking around, checking each guy, checking his specific controls. 34, 33, 32, 31, and then a red light goes on. And it stops at 30. Imagine what a moment that was in this capsule. They're still in it now, by the way, at this moment in the capsule. Uh, would you please, uh, if you will, in there, Herbert, would you lay one of our goodies on them? Yeah, well, let's see. Uh, <laughs> this kind of good uh, go good with your broadcast corned beef hash. If you'd like to uh, enjoy elegant French wines with your meals, that'll make a nice combination, a little rosé and corned beef hash. Uh, well, here's your chance. You don't have to worry about all those, uh, you know, complicated French names. Uh, you just select one name, Alexis Lachine. <laughs> Come on, sing, you guys. Sing it out loud. You can get that, those potatoes out of your mouth. That's it. 
Very nice. That was real sexy. Let's see. Make sure this machine. Yeah, now, let's, uh, since we're on a food kick here, we'd like to lay a little recommendation on you here. Yeah, hey, did you know that, that, uh, that they predict, speaking of food, uh, the next big thing in space? And I, I just wonder whether or not we're getting so blasé in our time that most of us just sort of take these space shots uh, kind of uh, pretty much for granted, really. And, of course, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're fabulous. They're fantastic. Maybe it's because it's beyond the grasp of most of us who we tend to take anything that's totally beyond our grasp uh, for granted. But uh, this is the last one, really, and quite probably the last one that most of us will be witness to, manned flight to another body in space, We're talking about the moon or Mars, whatever it might be, manned is the key word. This is quite probably the last one that any of us will ever see in our lifetime. It occurred to you, Herb? Well, they claim that of this century, not too many people are going to be around that, that are listening tonight, say, in 2040, uh, when <laughs> they start all over again. But uh, they're quite possible. It's quite a big possibility. This is the last manned flight that any of us will see uh, to another planet or another body in space. There will be, of course, space platforms. Uh, there will be a manned space laboratory, but that's not what we're referring to. We're talking about a flight to an alien body in space. Uh, not a man-made body, but an alien body by men. Uh, and they say that, uh, according to most experts, this is probably the last in this century. So, uh, don't go to bed before they take off. This is, <laughs> this is it, man. You can't say, well, oh my God, I'll see the next one. No way. Uh, this, is, this is the last one. And you know, speaking of, uh, of uh, manned space flight, if you've read much about the Sky Lab that they're working on, that they hope to have up sometime around near the end of the 70s, where guys will stay in space uh, orbiting the Earth something like 70 days or maybe uh, something. So I think it's in that area of time, 70 days, maybe 75 days. And it's a real house. It looks like a house inside. Have you seen mock-ups of it? And they, they uh, say that, among other things, they're going to have a, a great wide selection of food because they figure that boredom is one of the big problems. And uh, so these guys will have a real galley, and they'll have all this stuff made up. And among other things they plan to have is an international cuisine, which kind of lends a little touch of elegance to it. You know, I can imagine one night that they decide to go Chinese, and they're all sitting around uh, drinking Chinese wines and eating sweet and sour, whatever it is they come in those compressed uh, cans. But... Uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to investigate at the House of Chan to find out if they've made any bids, you know, in the space program there to make sure that the, some of the House of Chan wonton soup is sent up on the lab. And uh, if you'd like to try this soup right here on Earth, you'll find out why they've been talking about it. Well, those of you who've tuned in again late and don't know what's happening, they uh, had a delay at 30 seconds before blast off. 30 seconds. The uh, automatic. Uh, relay, some automatic relay kicked out somewhere along the line and said, hold the, hold the scene, hold it. And everybody sat back, and uh, now the automatic testing equipment, of course, you know, you know this, this type of equipment has, uh, has also built into it. It has automatic diagnostic capabilities. You know that, don't you? Which means that it doesn't just stop, and then you've got to go and get your voltometer. Everybody runs around and goes get, gets their pliers and their soldering iron to figure out what's wrong. <laughs> this this equipment literally diagnoses its own il ailments, its own illnesses, and it uh, it tells immediately what stage, what circuit. Of course, then then they have to start pressing buttons. It tells what block of circuits the problem is in, and uh, at that point, then they have to go down through a they call it a, a systems reduction technique which means that you press various uh, test buttons, sending various signals through various pieces of equipment until finally you arrive at the stage where the trouble is. It takes just a few minutes with this kind of equipment. Uh, it proved that it's invaluable qualities on, on Apollo 13 uh, when uh, through very quick diagnostic work they could find out exactly what was wrong with that space capsule, even though it was an explosion. You know, Remember out, at, out in space? So... Uh, this kind of... Uh, now, perhaps you're curious why I would know something about this. Well, 
uh, when I was uh, in the service, I spent three years in the service, I was involved in radar. Now, this, uh, this is a highly complex piece of equipment, a tremendous... And there are a lot of similarities uh, in this type of equipment to the type of equipment that's being used in the space program. High voltages, uh, tremendously complex circuits, extremely sensitive uh, stages that are light-sensitive, heat-sensitive, and so on down the line. And in this equipment, as we worked, uh, as a technician, we all had to learn a thing called systems analysis, which is literally uh, a, a system of analyzing the entire system, not just circuits, but the entire system in, in, a, in a sequence that is highly logical and is unchanging. So that uh, the minute there's trouble, uh, we would go through a, a, an immediate drill of various types of checks that would go uh, very quickly down to the specific stage. Now, uh, our, our equipment, too, could diagnose itself, sort of, but not always. You know that there's some, some types of equipment now that's self-healing. Uh, this, this, uh, this might surprise you, that not only does it diagnose itself, it then makes a prescription. It does. It's, it says, well, I guess what I'll do now, I see what I'll have to do now. I'll have to cut off that series of blood supply, which is really what it's saying. It says I'll have to cut off that series of blood supply and work in on another one. And at the meantime, we'll see if we can uh, cure the transistor that went bad. Uh, so this this stuff is really it's almost uh, it's eerie uh, this this type of electronics that we're dealing with here. Boy, I'll tell you what we can do. What do you say? Let's let's be. Uh, we got a couple of minutes here. Let's. Uh, Let's be uh, let's be big about it. Do you have that general tire thing in there? You dig it up out of there. That's all right. I think Jerry can dig it up for me while we're at it. Uh, hit the general tire. Yeah, run in there and get it because we got a couple of minutes there. And uh, I, I personally, I'm I'm delighted to be on the air tonight uh, uh, because most of the space things uh, that I've, uh, you know, I've, it's always been vicarious to me because I haven't really been on the air the night so they've done it uh, generally because we're carrying remotes and. Jack is down there right now, waiting for the big signal. And in just a few minutes, we'll be uh, we'll be going back down to the Cape, uh, sometime after Lester Smith's news, sometime after 11:15, and we'll begin the countdown. In the meantime, let's lay another goodie on him here. Yes, uh, here's a safe driving tip from General Tire. Watch your Nixies. <laughs> Increase the air pressure in your tires to the car manual recommendation. Or decrease it, too. Sometimes people put too much air in their tires. So, here's another tip, too. Get General Jet White Walls. They're great tires. Dual tread design. And they're priced low. Large sizes available. You check in at your local General Tire headquarters. General Tire, they're listed in the yellow pages. Bring it up there, please, sir. Now sing it, gang. All right, that's choo-choo. Thank you very much, General Kyle. Yes, they're listed. No, that's it. Now, now I want to say uh, uh, one thing. Uh, I would suggest that if you can conceivably see any of these, this shot uh, in color, see it. It's fantastic colors. You know that they claim that they... When the uh, when the first shots went off, that there were certain colors that were recorded. Did you read about this, Herb? Certain colors that were recorded, uh, that were seen and recorded on camera and on film, were the first time those colors had ever been seen on Earth. There were colors that approached the kind of color that is created by the sun. That's uh, because of the fantastic amount of power that was generated. In other words, there were colors that are created under highly abnormal situations, fantastic situations. Now, <laughs> this stuff doesn't necessarily come out over TV, but wow, uh, we're creating colors close, and heats, by the way, that approximate uh, the kind of heat that is found on the surface of the sun. Shoo wee <laughs> Wow. And uh, those three guys are still laying there in their capsule now. What do they do? You know what they do? For one thing, they pipe music into them. Did you know that? Yeah, they have a system where they can where they can throw uh, a tape deck and uh, plug it in, and they can uh, hear music. Or if they want, uh, you know, they can uh, pick up on a little TV, or maybe they uh, even listen to this show. 
Who knows? They do. Are you aware that on the way out, that uh, that the uh, they were listening to AM radio, many of the, many of these space flights, all the way to the moon, and uh, quite conceivably uh, they listened to our show. It could could happen, but uh, they they. <laughs> They, they were getting commercials and all this. Now, that may surprise you to know that, that radio goes out in the fantastic, vast reaches of space. Television doesn't. Radio, yes. And so, as they get further and further out there, uh, they, they tune in. They pick up the, the new news. They, they uh, listen to, uh, you know, Little Rock. They may pick up on the Shepherd Show. Who knows? But uh, I've often wondered now, as I talk tonight, how far out in space it really does go. Because they claim that they could hear broadcast stations from the Earth. They even tried it. It was one of the tests they did on the last moonwalk. Loud and clear on the moon. Many broadcast stations. So you can imagine how far out we're going tonight. You know, past Galaxy 7. All the way out to Arcturus Neptunus IV. So good luck, men. Just be patient. 